Please open your Bible to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. As we dive into the, the middle, but as we dive into a, a book here, um, sort of parachuting in, uh, just to give a little insight into where we are in this book, or where we find ourselves today, um, we have before us in this text the church really still in her infancy. The church is very young still at this stage. And at this time, the church is led um, basically exclusively by the apostles. They are bearing that load of leadership at the church in Jerusalem. Now, while the church is young, it is already numbering in the thousands. As we saw at the day of Pentecost that uh, some 3,000 souls were brought into the church I'd imagine many of those were in Jerusalem, many of those were, were, were pilgrimaging and ended up going back to wherever they were from. But as we continue reading the book of Acts, we've seen, or you will have seen up to chapter 6, that multitudes have been added into the church already. That day by day, God is adding to the number of the church there in Jerusalem. And up until this point, the apostles have carried the entire load of Leadership. It's been on their shoulders. And we see today that load of leadership finally coming to a head as the demands of ministry are too much and the office of deacon is birthed here in Acts chapter 6. And what's interesting, I think it's helpful for us to see uh, the organic development of the church. You know, someone might say this isn't about deacons because the noun deacon is not there. Or should we have deacons in the church because God never gave a clear thou shalt ordain deacons and elders necessarily. But we see that often that's not how things play out in Scripture. And what we see here is that because of a need that arose within the church, under the providence of God, seven men are raised up. But what we see as we've been looking at 1 Timothy is that less than 30 years later, the office of, of deacon is codified in holy writ. So by that point, Paul expects churches to raise up elders and deacons. So while this comes out of a need, it becomes solidified as the normal practice very quickly. And so we see here today, we'll, we'll look at, we'll try to understand the duty, the blessings of deacons for churches, and then next week we'll be back in 1 Timothy 3 to see Paul's qualifications that he gives to Timothy. And so Acts chapter 6, verse 1 is where I'll start, and this is the Word of God. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Verse 7 And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. May God bless the reading and preaching of His Word. Father, we do come now and ask Your blessing upon this time. Lord, we pray that Your Spirit would be at work through the preaching of Your Word, that I would decrease, that You would increase, that You might uh, own this sermon today, God, that we would see the, 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 the blessing of the diaconate as you've given this office to the church. Um, Lord, help us to see that all of Scripture is sufficient and it is 
good for us to, to train us in righteousness, to reprove, correct, and, and to help the man of God be uh, complete for every good work. And so help us, God, to understand and to believe and to follow you in obedience. And so we commit this time to you. We ask your blessing upon all that is done here in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it seems as we look at history, the office and duty of a deacon has been understood in a variety of ways in in Baptist churches. I'm thinking Baptist churches here specifically, in our own tradition. Going back to the early to mid-1600s, we've seen the office of deacon sort of evolve and change over time. You might step foot today in a Baptist church, and you might see in one church the deacons are set aside for benevolence and sort of what we've seen here in our text today, or what we will see, all the way to the other extreme where the deacons act as a sort of executive board that leads and rules and governs the church, and everything really in between. And for various reasons, beyond scope of our study here, The common practice in Southern Baptist type churches, as we've been discussing, has become a single elder, a single pastor, usually with a board of deacons that come alongside the pastor. Sometimes they act as servants in the church, and sometimes they act as pseudo elders, basically functioning as elders are called to function. Maybe you've been in such a church. The deacons in churches that rule, They may not teach and preach. Sometimes they will. Um, But our task before us today, as always, is to search the Scriptures. It's to study the Word of God that we might show ourselves approved and to try to understand the mind of Christ and understand His will for His church. We don't want to be novel or creative when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We want to be faithful to the text. That is our duty and our and, and, and hopefully our passion. And so our job is to search the scriptures and then as God provides, raise up deacons to fulfill the role that God has given them, their biblical duties in the church. And so we want to discern today, what does a deacon do and why is it a blessing to have deacons in the church of Jesus Christ? So as we look back into verse 1, it says that in these days... When the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, something shocking has taken place here in the church. I don't want you to be put off by this. You've probably never seen this before. Certainly, you've never seen it here, First Baptist Church. But sin and division have come into the body, right? And I say that tongue-in-cheek because as you gather with sinners, at times, we offend one another, right? We sin against one another. And so we see that there is some conflict between the Hellenists and between the Hebrews. Now, I think it's worth noting that this early, already in the church, They have a formal benevolence ministry that is functioning. They are taking care of the widows that they deem uh, that they need to be taken care of. And I think it's also worth noting, I don't want to build a theology off of this, but their ministry is to the body of Christ. It's to the church. This isn't a benevolence ministry to the world or the community. Not saying there's anything wrong with that. But their priority, it seems here, is the widows in the church that they are taking care of. And I think one thing that we also see here is an implicit nod to church membership. It does not say thou shalt have a church membership, but what we see is they have such a formal roster, if you will, or understanding of who is who, that there's even a subgroup of Christians known as the widows, and they know which ones they are to care for because they have some sort of way of keeping track of these things. So they seem to have an understanding of who's in and who's out. And we saw that there's division taking place with the Hellenists and with the Hebrews. Now, what, is that, what does that mean? 
I'm reading out of the ESV, and there's a footnote on the word Hellenist, and it says Greek-speaking Jews. Greek-speaking Jews. So at this time, the, the church is still almost exclusively Jewish, this early on in, in, the, in the game. And you have two types of Jews, if you will. You have those that are called the Hebrews, and they are those that speak the language of their fathers, and they have hung on to the traditions and the culture of Judaism. And then you have those Hellenists that have uh, maybe lost some of the culture of their heritage. They don't speak the language, they speak Greek. And there's some division between these two groups. And maybe you've seen this in real life. I know growing up in Southern California in primarily Spanish areas and then in primarily Vietnamese areas, uh, there would commonly be two groups in this regard. You have one group, when, when, a, when, a, when a people have migrated to another nation, you have one group that wants to hold on to their heritage, and so they're teaching Spanish in the home. They want their children to know the language. You have another group that is a little more Americanized, right? And they speak English in the home, and they've lost some of their heritage. And these two groups often look down on one another. You're too Americanized, and you're just old-fashioned and need to, you know, progress. And they have even derogatory names for each other, which I won't mention here. But it's sort of a common thing, because sin or sin, right? We, we, we have racist tendencies, people do. And so really what's happening here is that they're showing partiality. They're treating members of the body of Christ in an inferior way, as if they're less than. And God hates partiality. He hates unjust scales. He hates when people are treated poorly for foolish, insignificant reasons. And so we see that that is taking place here. There is division within the church, and some people are getting treated better and less than the others. And so the deacons are appointed. The deacons are brought in. These seven men are called to recover and preserve the unity in the body. And so the first thing that I want to point out is that the deacons here are called to be peacemakers. They're called to be peacemakers. They are striving for unity within the body. Really, this is just an application of Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, or the book of Ephesians, as he gets into 4, 5, and 6, begins to talk about our life as a body, right? This new family that we've been brought into and how we are to treat and love one another within the church. And Paul says there in Ephesians 4, 2, that we are to walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He goes on to say there is one body, one Spirit, one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. We share all of these things in common, and so one of the most fundamental virtues of a Christian church ought to be unity. Right? That we are one family, one people coming together with one mind, one desire, one burden for the gospel to advance and to spread. This really is part and parcel, is it not, for a pe people that have been transformed by the work of the gospel. That we ought to not live any longer for ourselves, but for Christ and for others. That God calls us all to have a sort of servant's heart, to not think about ourselves first and foremost, but to think about those around us. And so the deacons have been brought in as peacemakers to stem off this division and disunity. One ministry out there calls deacons shock absorbers. Shock absorbers. I like that illustration. I think it's helpful if you get in a car that has no shocks, how is the ride? <laughs> if you've ever had a car with broken shocks or worn out shocks, how does that thing ride? It's pretty rough, right? You feel every bump, every crack, every pothole, every trouble in the road. You feel the brunt of it. It's, it hurts even. It can be painful. And so deacons are the first line of defense within the body when division and disunity rise up within the congregation. They are godly 
trustworthy men that can wisely and maturely resolve conflicts and contentions in the church. Because if you think about our text, and this is, this is my, my thinking here, if you think about this text, the, the surface issue, the fruit, is that benevolence is not being equally distributed. But that's really the fruit. That's not the root of the problem, right? The root of the problem is division and sin and partiality taking place within the church. The root of the problem is that subgroups of people have been formed and Christians are looking down their nose at one another, looking at other Christians as less than themselves. Really what's happened is our worldly sinful thinking and tendencies have not all yet been put to death and so they've joined us in the midst of the congregation. And so really, the, the root problem is this issue of Christians sinning against one another, being divisive. And so the apostles wisely see a need that needs to be dealt with, and they want to address it. But they also wisely acknowledge that their hands are full, right? That they, they, they are at capacity with their ministry. They have other things that they want to focus on. And so a few observations initially from what we've seen so far, a few things that we might learn and glean from just this first verse or so. Firstly, number one, sin and division will happen in a church. Sin and division will happen in a church. You get a group of sinners come together in a large family, and issues are bound to arise. The church is a hospital for people that need to be healed. Amen? For messy, broken people. We don't come into the church already remade and good to go. We come in our sin, right? And so we don't want to ever excuse away sin. We don't want to ever act as if it's no big deal because, hey, we're all sinners. But I think we need to be careful not to have a sort of naive, unrealistic view of the church. That when I come into a body, it's going to be utopia. And all the sin exists out there. But when I come into the church, I'm never going to be offended. I'm never going to be hurt because we're all, we all have the Spirit of God. Amen, we do. <laughs> but if you've spent any time in a church, you know that things happen. And so if we come into a congregation with this mindset that I, I can never be hurt here, no one's going to break my trust, no one's going to offend me, then I'm setting myself up right, to be disillusioned. And I really think that this often happens, that people expect that things are going to be perfect in the church. Number one, they forget that they're sinners as well, that they don't come perfect into a body. But when something happens, we're shocked that, oh, not in the church. And so we, instead of dealing with it, we just, we leave, right? We, maybe we go somewhere else down the street, or maybe we go back to the couch on Sunday morning and turn on a sermon. And so we see, firstly, that sin and division will happen in the church. Secondly, then, it should be dealt with head on. It needs to be dealt with head on. You see that the disciples, they don't wait around. They don't, they don't let this thing build up. But they say, hey, here's an issue. We have men that are qualified to take care of this. We don't have to do it ourselves. These brothers are very able. Raise them up and let them deal with this and all the other issues that might arise from the beginning, right? As they rear their head. And so thirdly, not only do we deal with them head on, but I think we learn here that we should deal with them immediately. We should deal with them immediately. I, I, it's my conviction that so much pain and hurt and trouble that often happens in churches could be avoided if we just dealt with issues when they happened. Right? When an offense comes, when someone sins against you, when you sin against them, that we go to one another, that we confess our sin, that we let someone know that they've hurt us. Because oftentimes, maybe we say, no, it's okay, I don't want to go there, I don't want to deal with that. But usually, things aren't reconciled on their own, right? They don't just all the time go away. And that hurt, that offense, whatever it is, can fester and build up, and all of a sudden there's an explosion, and because we didn't deal with it here, it's at a 10 here, and so someone gets hurt 
and just takes off and just parts ways. And I think we, I'm getting ahead of myself a couple, by a couple weeks here. But if we've, we, we often maybe view the church like a relationship that we have with an acquaintance. You know, if I don't really know you and you disrespect my wife or something foolish, I'm probably, I'm not really invested here. You're a jerk, I'm going to part ways because that wasn't cool and I, I don't have any investment. But if we see our commitment to a local body more like a marriage, that we're going to work through hard stuff. Sadly, a lot of people today treat marriages like they do with an acquaintance, right? It gets hard. We don't put in the hard work. We just walk away. And that thinking is often in the church. Someone sins against me. I don't like what's going on here. I'm offended. Instead of sitting down and working it out, we just sort of part ways. And before you know it, that's happened two, three, four times. And you're disillusioned about the church. When I think some of that could be avoided by coming together in a mature way and dealing with the issues. And so we see the deacons have been raised up as peacemakers, as shock absorbers, heading off some of this division and disunity in the body of Christ. We go now to verse 2, and we see that the twelve summoned, the twelve apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so here we have the apostles saying, look, there's an issue we don't have the time to deal with this, but we have men here that can. Let's find some. Let's raise them up. Let's pray for them. Let's lay hands on them, and let's put them into service. I believe that the Bible gives us a lot of latitude as to what a deacon actually does in the church. Some have said that this text speaks exhaustively about the work of a deacon. I don't think the text is meaning to say that. I don't think that's the motivation or the goal of this passage. But I do think that we can be helped by what we read here, what we learn that the deacons do not do. Right? The apostles, carried on later by the elders, saw their main duty as the word and prayer. That was what they wanted to focus on. Everything else was secondary to these primary tasks. And so we don't see deacons being called to preach or teach. Can a deacon preach? Sure. Just like a man that's not ordained can, I believe, come and fill the pulpit and, and preach God's word if he is able and gifted. But we don't see it as part of their office. And we also, <laughs> we don't see anywhere in Scripture where the deacons are ruling the church, overseeing the church, leading or governing the church. And so we're helped as we think about their office by what they don't do. They're not called to preach and teach as their office, and they're not called to lead or to govern. So what are they to do? Well, secondly, I think we see that the, the deacons care for practical needs within the church. They care for practical needs within the body. They, the word uh, deacon is translated from the word diakonos. Usually that word is translated servant many times in the Bible. Sometimes it's translated minister, and occasionally it's translated deacon. We don't find that word in this text, but we do find the verb form where the apostles say, we're not going to give up the word of God to serve tables. And so sometimes deacons are called table servants, not as a, meaning, meaning, you know, a, a, a demeaning name, but just the fact that they are servants in the church. This word is used broadly, though. We see it all over the place. Paul is called a deacon through whom who you believed, a servant through whom who you believed. Uh, we see a lady named Phoebe in Romans chapter 16, who is a servant of the church, a deacon of the church. Um, one pastor points out that in the Roman world, to be a servant was to be despised. It was to be on the low end of the totem pole, and they looked at that as... as uh, something that was not respectable. 
But Jesus sort of turns that thinking on its head. Because Jesus says in John 12, 26, that whoever deacons me, serves me, must follow me, and where I am, my deacon, my servant, also will be. My father will honor the one who deacons me, Jesus says, or the one who serves me. He goes on elsewhere to say, whoever wants to become great among you must be your deacon, must be your servant, and the greatest among you will be your deacon. Timothy is called a deacon of Christ. Paul identifies himself as a deacon to the Gentiles. Peter says that the Old Testament prophets were deacons to Christians. And so the word is usually translated servant, but you see that word is used very broadly. And so a deacon in Christ's church is a servant of the church in the plainest terms. He will serve the church in a variety of ways to the glory of God. So what are some ways? What are some practical ways that deacons serve in the church? We see clearly here in chapter 6 that they receive and distribute benevolence. They are responsible here for caring for the widows, making sure they get the resources, the funds, whatever it is they're giving out here, the meals. They're, they're overseeing that ministry. Um, deacons often care for the facilities. They oversee and steward the church property, whether that be organizing the cleaning or the upkeep or maintenance or all that is entailed in the care of the church's property. Deacons often steward that as well. They often act as ushers, distributing bulletins, seating congregants, preparing the elements of the Lord's table, basically all the practical needs that need to take place on the Lord's day. Deacons often fulfill those roles. And lastly, they care for the practical needs of God's people, whether it be widows, whether it be needy folks. A, uh, a friend of mine, a pastor in Grants Pass, their deacons have a widow's list. And once a month, they go, down, they go around with a truck, with lawnmower equipment, and they go mow all the lawns of all the widows and needy folks in the church that are unable to do it themselves. Right? They're meeting a practical need that these saints are unable to meet on their own. They don't have family members and friends that, that are helping them. And so the church is fulfilling those needs. And so I think you can see that the scope of the work of a deacon is broad. There are many things that they do as they meet those simple, practical needs in the church. But I think you can also see that they are invaluable to be a blessing in that regard to, so, that, so that God's people and their needs are not getting missed or glossed over. Verse 4, But we, says the apostles, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And so this act of laying on of hands is where we get our concept of ordination. And so this is a formal placing these men into service as the apostles come around them, pray for them, and lay their hands on them. I think that shows that this is just more than a few folks meeting a need, but they're being called into the service of the church. And so we see here basically and lastly that the, the deacons support the elders. The deacons are a support system for the elders. Notice what has happened. Uh, these men have been called to meet the many needs of the church, and now the apostles are freed up to focus on the priorities that God has given them, namely the word and prayer. And so the deacons and the elders are working in tandem within the church, elders having oversight over the congregation and the deacons coming alongside them under their authority to fill in the gaps not covered by the elders. And we see the benefit, right? We see the result in verse 7. I don't believe this is a promise, um, but certainly it's a fruit of what has happened here. Verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. 
So the apostles were able to fulfill their ministry of word and prayer. The saints' needs were being met, and the church is flourishing in Jerusalem as those that are called are able to fulfill their ministry. And so what do we see here? Let me, let me sort of wrap this up and summarize what we see here. I think what we see in its early stages is a beautiful picture of a church functioning as God has designed it. Functioning as God has designed it. We see elders, here apostles, later the elders, laboring in the word and in prayer. They're giving themselves to the care of the souls of God's people. They're taking the necessary time then to study to show themselves approved, spending the necessary time on their knees before the Lord, praying for the health and the well-being of the sheep. We see the deacons, servants of the church, laboring and loving the body of Christ. These are men, as we'll see next week, of good report, full of the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom, and they are ready and willing to take on the challenges that come with a church full of messy people, full of sinners, right? And they're also there to care for the practical, physical needs of the body of Christ and to be another set of eyes upon the flock so that Christ's sheep and their troubles don't get glossed over. And then lastly, we see the sheep loved and served well. In this picture, there are multiple layers of leaders and helpers ready to come alongside God's people. The elders now are not overwhelmed with so many practical duties that soul care gets missed, and the deacons are free to serve the body in meaningful ways so that all the needs of God's people are being met. Really, this is God's simple, practical design for a New Testament church. And in my opinion, it seems that sometimes we've sort of muddied the waters and made things a lot more complicated than God has given us. As we said in the beginning, many churches have deacons functioning as elders, whether they're qualified for that uh, role or not. Oftentimes when we have a committee-driven model, um, committees are not sinful, they're not all bad, but when we have a committee-driven model... What often happens is you have folks in those committees functioning as elders and deacons, doing the work that God has set aside for elders and deacons, and many of those folks may or may not be qualified to fulfill those roles. And when we do this, I believe it's confusing at best for the church, but harmful at worst, because God gives clear qualifications for those that lead and serve in His church. And so may we, as a church, be so bold to go back to the Bible and just seek to know the mind of God, to eschew modern wisdom and practices from corporate America, you know, all the wisdom that, that we often glean from Fortune 500 companies, and if they do it and it works so well, certainly it'll, it'll work for us. But what if we just do what God says as best we can? And so let us then continue, church, to build Christ's church in obedience to His Word as He has clearly commanded and trust Him to do what He promises, and that is to build His church. Amen.